Well, thank you again for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, the Tocqueville Lecture Series is named after Alexis de Tocqueville, born of the French aristocracy. Tocqueville examined the world to understand democracy. His investigations convinced him that liberal ideas, which rejected both the antiquity of aristocracy and doubted the promises of the French Revolution, were the progression of history. Whether individuals fought for or against these ideals, he was convinced that equality of conditions is a providential fact. This lecture series invites scholars, professionals, civic leaders uh, to come to campus, uh, come to Zoom, and present on the ideas of liberty and equality as they relate to other concepts important in the founding and continuation of American government. Hosted on the campus of Jacksonville State University, these free lectures are open to the public. We welcome the campus, the community, and the country to listen, think, reflect, and engage with each other. The Tocqueville Lecture Series is funded by generous grants from the Jack Miller Center and Alabama Humanities Alliance. The Jack Miller Center is dedicated to advancing education in America's history, its political and economic institutions, and the central principles, ideas, and issues arising from the American and Western traditions, which continue to animate our national life. The Alabama Humanities Alliance exists to provide context, build empathy, and make the state of Alabama a more vibrant place to live, all through the humanities. It's my pleasure tonight uh, to bring you not one, but two guests, uh, two lecturers, or I should say a lecturer and a respondent. Uh, Dr. Daniel Cohen is a professor of philosophy and directs the Project for the Study of Liberal Democracy, a program supporting teaching, scholarship, and critical discussions of the principles of constitutional government and the philosophic sources of those principles in the Western intellectual tradition. He's the author of Freedom and Rousseau's uh, Political Philosophy. I'll, I'll have to do a little, but this was a, this was a good book, uh, especially for when I was writing dissertation. Um, it's an autographed copy even. I mean, this was a rare thing to get. Um, <laughs> it's a prized possession. Which um, one of my kids sold it on eBay? <laughs> I, I, I plead the fifth on that. We'll have to go back to Amazon records. Uh, and he's also published various essays on democratic theory, liberal education, and most recently, the political philosophy of, of Roger Scruton. Uh, his recent book is on liberal democracy and liberal education, uh, which he edited and co-author. Uh, it's also a pleasure uh, to have actually our first repeat uh, individual uh, on the series. Uh, Dr. Joseph M. Nippenberg is a professor of politics at Oglethorpe University in Brookhaven, Georgia. Uh, he received his bachelor's in arts from Michigan State, go Spartans, uh, and his uh, master's degree and PhD from the University of Toronto. Uh, his area of expertise are the 17th and 18th century political philosophy, a uh, century political philosophy, uh, constitutional law, and liberal education. Uh, he is the editor with the late Peter Lawler of Poets, Princes, and Private Citizens, Literary Alternatives to Postmodern Politics, and he's published numerous of the edited volumes, articles, and uh, 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 art, uh, published journal articles, too. Uh, and so it's a pleasure to have him join us tonight as a discussant. Uh, I will hand it off here over in a second to Dr. Cohen with uh, present his lecture and presentation. Uh, of course, if you have questions throughout the presentation, uh, you can send those in our Q&A. Um, and also, if you want to wait till the end, um, you can raise your hand and we can unmute your mic and you can join us too. Uh, but with that, Dr. Cohen, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. And uh, I want to uh, thank Ben especially for not only inviting me, but for being extraordinarily patient uh, with me about scheduling this this talk. A lot of it had to do with the fact that I uh, just couldn't figure out what it was I wanted to, to say. It turns out uh, that I'm going to say more about Tocqueville than I had intended uh, originally, but then managed to pry an abstract of my talk from my cold dead hands recently and I rewarded him with something that was indeed as abstract as I could possibly make it. And um, in defense of my reluctance about all of this, my topic turns out to be a problem for which I, I think I have a description, but I don't have a solution. Here's, here's what I began with in my uh, abstract in the form of three assertions. The first, liberal democracy is established on the foundation of modern political ideas. 
but it depends on more than the principles of natural rights and popular sovereignty that are at the heart of those ideas. Number two, for this reason, one can ask whether democracy has not one, but two constitutions or foundations. On one hand, a parchment regime, it's a, a term Joseph Cropsey used, enshrining an agreement among naturally free and equal individuals on the basis of which those figuratively asocial individuals morph into a people and citizens. And on the other hand, an existing community, a nation with a history, customs, and character that constitutes the framework within the democratic principle operates. The third point is that democracy thus seems to have dual origin stories, one theoretical, one historical or actual. And the first, emphasizing, as I said, popular sovereignty, involves its own duality insofar as the democratic sovereign appears to be both the individual and the people. From this ambiguity, some significant tensions arise in the operation of liberal democracy. Well, uh, already you agree that this is a terrible way to start a talk with all this abstraction because these so-called tensions that many contemporary political theorists obsess over are probably not that familiar to normal people. So I wanna make a new beginning. And uh, surely it's de rigueur to begin any talk for the Tocqueville lecture series by quoting a passage from the man himself. And I've got a doozy of one. It comes from the preface to the old regime and the revolution written 20 years after democracy in America. But Tocqueville tells us it's the same thought he had expressed in his earlier and more famous book. This is a long quotation but I impose it on you because I think it conveys better than I can everything I plan to discuss tonight. So this is number point four. People today no longer attach to one another by any ties of caste, class, guild, or family are all too inclined to be preoccupied with their own private interests, too given to looking out for themselves alone and withdrawing into a narrow individualism where all public virtues are smothered. Despotism, rather than struggling against this tendency, makes it irresistible because it takes away from citizens all common feeling, all common needs, all need for communication, all occasion for common action. It walls them up inside their private lives they already tend to keep themselves apart from one another. Despotism isolates them. It chills their relations. It freezes them. And the quote con continues, this is uh, slide five. In these kinds of societies where nothing is fixed, everything is const everyone is constantly tormented by the fear of falling and by the ambition to rise the desire to enrich oneself at any price, the preference for business, the love of profit, the search for material pleasure and comfort are therefore the most widespread desires. These desires spread easily among all classes and if nothing stops them, they soon succeed in demoralizing and degrading the entire nation. So as for what might reverse or slow this decline, Tocqueville answers this way, only freedom can effectively combat the natural vices of these kinds of societies and prevent them from sliding down the slippery slope where they find themselves. Only freedom can bring the isolation in which the very independence of their circumstances has led them to live, can daily force them to mingle to join together through the need to communicate with one another, persuade each other, satisfy each other in the conduct of their common affairs. Only freedom can tear people from the worship of mammon and the petty daily concerns of their personal affairs and teach them to always see and feel the nation above and beside them. 
only freedom can substitute higher and stronger passions for the love of material well-being and give rise to greater ambitions. And lastly, while democratic societies that are not free can be, Tocqueville says, wealthy, refined, powerful, and while they may contain good people, honest business people, and even, Tocqueville adds, some good Christians, what will never exist, he says, in such societies are great citizens and above all, a great people. You'll agree that this is an extraordinary statement, and I hope you'll agree that it adds some flesh to my uh, initial abstract formulation. And uh, this is a slide eight. The dependence of liberal democracy on a community with mores, that's the French term they know that Tocqueville uses uh, a lot in which he gets from Montesquieu and, and Rousseau. The dependence of liberal democracy on a community with mores that support its principles while not being derived from them is at risk because people today are no longer attached to one another by traditional ties. Uh, this is slide nine, Ben. People today are hardly citizens or a nation in any dignified sense. Remember that point about being degraded and, and demoralized. And this arises from what I think one can only call a defect in the soul that Tocqueville is concerned about. And then next, the soul of liberal democracy is in decline because of a natural tendency of its ruling ideas to foster a demoralizing and degrading materialism and privatism. Something has gone wrong in the individual soul under the regime of popular sovereignty that can be reversed or slowed, if at all, only by the exercise of a political freedom, which one might be excused for having taken for granted as characteristic of a democratic age, but something in the nature of democracy causes a depoliticizing tendency to, in Tocqueville's words, renfermer en nous-mêmes, to enclose ourselves in ourselves and view ourselves as the exclusive source of all human attachments. This is the tendency that finally erodes the solidarity of the social body that makes a people a people or a nation a nation and confines the democratic individual within the solitude of his own heart, as Tocqueville famously says. For this reason, I refer to two constitutions or foundings or starting points, one at the level of ideas and principles, another at the level of customs, mill, and social bonds, corresponding, if you will, to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of 1787, and to what Tocqueville calls on the other hand, America's point of departure in the New England Puritan experience. The problem is that the primacy of the theoretical foundation seems to undermine the other foundation. I might make the point more provocatively by suggesting that the preservation of a freedom cherishing or liberal political order depends on a conservative foundation of morals, habits, and attachments. Here's what I mean. Liberalism is a philosophy of limited government whose purpose is to guarantee the rights and freedoms of individuals who are imagined to be originally outside or prior to, and therefore independent of any political order. Recall the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, which quite strikingly, Tocqueville never mentions in Democracy in America. The idea of the social contract, which is expressed in that view, epitomizes the liberal political consciousness that, as I said, conceives moral order arising from the union of individual wills. In this view, the world is ordered neither by God nor by nature, but by human beings themselves. Morality, 
is construed as arising from a rational agreement among individuals to determine the scope of their obligations and the character of their interactions. Such individuals are understood to be radically free or sovereign over themselves, to use a term of John Stuart Mill's, unencumbered by unchosen identities or loyalties. And whereas ancient uh, thinkers like Aristotle had assumed the natural character of social bonds, modern theorists like Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau stress that human beings are neither naturally social nor naturally law-abiding. Their essential independence from authority follows from the theoretical premise of their independence of one another in this pre-political state of nature in which each individual is regarded, as Rousseau once put it, as a perfect and solitary whole. So the democratic social state, as Tocqueville calls it, resembles the fictive state of nature insofar as it reinforces our conviction that our default political setting is not obedience, but freedom. Each individual naturally obeys only himself and political life reflects and respects that sovereignty over oneself. But the question arises, once democracy is predicated on the most asocial foundation imaginable, the state of nature, how will we be capable of attaching ourselves to anything in common? And this brings us to the famous problem of individualism that Tocqueville described, a condition, as I said, of depoliticization and dissociation. It's been captured powerfully by the French theorist Pierre Manant, who writes, if democratic men are citizens, they can only be free citizens because civic life presupposes the abandonment of this independence that has totally gained their favor. Consequently, they are not willingly free citizens. The democratic dogma thus engenders indifference to public things. And since civic life presupposes the abandonment of the independence to which democratic men are devoted, it pushes them along the line of least resistance to accede to despotism, provided that it preserves the appearance of independence. That is to say, provided it invokes the democratic dogma. In postulating that independence is the natural state of man, Manon continues, the dogma of popular sovereignty suggests that the humanity of man is entirely contained in each individual. The humanity of man is in right, if not in fact, inseparable insepar from the body politic in which he lives. What tradition thought was the result of a rigorous exercise of civic and moral virtues, namely to live free, democracy holds as a minimal requisite of humanity. Independence, therefore, must find a place in all human relations between men and women, father and child, even before man and God. The social contract is, of course, a proposition of political reason rather than historical fact in which, as I've said, political commitment is justified by an appeal to the pre-social interests of individuals who do not already acknowledge a common good. In this contractual view, authority is justified only insofar as liberty requires it. But again, a question arises concerning the sufficiency of rational agreement to the creation and preservation of an actual political association. As one leading contemporary contractarian theorist acknowledges, quote, if the reasons for contract arise out of our pre-social needs in a hypothetical state of nature, society is conceived as a mere instrument for people whose fundamental motivation is pre-social, non-social, and fixed. It cannot therefore be regarded as an end in itself. 
But can a society that relies on such instrumental rationality for its inner unity endure? If it's held together only by the convergence of interests among its members, what will prevent its dissolution when those interests diverge? Historically, the social order has relied on a spirit of solidarity unaccounted for by the contractarian conception of human nature. And as another contemporary contractarian theorist, John Charvet puts it, and I'm quoting, because their social practices have no other ground than their own reason and will, human beings must assume responsibility for their own moral norms. To do so, they must rise above the particularities of their social formation and choose from a general and abstract vantage point the rules governing their future cooperation. This might remind you of um, John Rawls's conception of the original position in which we choose our principles of justice while remaining behind a veil of ignorance concerning who we actually are. I think it's fair to say it's a vision of radical autonomy in which purely rational choices replace, quote, blinding, conser uh, blindly conservative and unreflective grounds of social belonging. That's Charvet. And to his credit, Charvet acknowledges that abandonment of traditional ethical horizons necessarily triggers what he calls a serious theoretical and practical crisis. And it's that experience of crisis on two levels, which I think provokes a conservative response, which Charvet himself uh, anticipates. So let me say a few words about that response to the conservative mind, as it were. The view that the only legitimate obligations are self-imposed ones takes a decisive step away from what Roger Scruton calls a religious conception of the world, and indeed from all substantive conceptions of the human good that have traditionally shaped the bonds of membership in political communities as we see them. If the social contract represents an agreement to transform the state of nature into society, as Scruton puts it, it also threatens to overwrite society with the abstract features of that hypothetical condition, displacing the citizen with the universal man, quote unquote, who is all that he is prior to any law, political or religious. In seeking to establish a purely political, that is to say, a purely voluntary, non-customary bond, social contract thinking both assumes the irrelevance of traditional social ties and contributes to their destruction. The problem with this theoretical perspective then is that all bonds of membership are understood to flow from the abstract rights of the citizen in a way uh, that nevertheless depends on the very social foundation that it purports to supersede. And for a conservative like Roger Scruton, the conundrum of the social contract then is that if people are to bear the burdens of social cooperation, they must already view themselves as sharing what he calls a first person plural identity. But this we is established neither by a hypothetical construction nor by an originating act of will, but only by a real experience of belonging. Bereft of any ground of unity other than individual will, Scruton argues, social contract theory is self-disqualifying as a foundation for civil society for it fails to account for citizens' own conception of their social nature. And that latter thing is irreducible to abstract formulations, yet graspable by intuitions of meaning, secure enough to supply the motive for the sacrifices which human communities inevitably require. 
Such institutions, he says, urge us towards membership in a community understood not as a matter of negotiation or contract, but as a destiny and a gift. So the conservative theorist, generically, so to speak, does not so much dispute the justice of contractual relations as underscore their insufficiency, emphasizing their dependence on relations of belonging that, in Scruton's words, precede political choice and make it possible, precede political choice and make political choice possible. In sum, the social contract posits a group of people coming together to agree on their future, but they can only do so because they recognize that they already have a future, that they share a common fate rooted in their historical experience as a people and a nation. Scruton one more time, take away the experience of membership and the ground of social contract disappears. Social obligations become temporary, troubled, and defeasible. Now, conservative philosophy, I think, can be said to arise from a skepticism about the liberal picture of individuality or selfhood that I've been sketching and which is familiar to those of you who have studied modern political theory. But to put it more positively, the conservative views the, per the human person as essentially relational rather than autonomous. This was a favorite point of the late Peter Lawler, who was a great Tocqueville scholar, and as it happens, a dear friend and, and mentor of Joe Knippenberg. In this conservative perspective, individual freedom is not regarded as a premise, but as an achievement, one that emerges in and through a social process in which we discover what we value and build attachments to those things that we value along the way. To quote Scruton one more time, the process whereby human beings acquire their freedom also builds their attachments and the institutions of law, education and politics are part of this, not things that we freely choose from a position of detachment. Now, why, you're probably asking, does this ponderous issue of the nature of the self matter? Because when individual rights are the exclusive source of social and political legitimacy, the trajectory of social life is toward the progressive emancipation from the framework of customs and institutions that give concrete expression to freedom in the first place from the conservative point of view. But this progressive victory produces a paradoxical result. While liberty may be the best condition for human action, Pierre Menon observes, it cannot by itself give any finality to it or purpose to it. Everyone understands what the right to pursue happiness means in a situation where a religion or a government claims to impose a certain conception of the good life. But, Manon says, when churches as well as governments have renounced this claim, what does the exercise of this right mean? So long as it is not in dialogue with something other than itself, he says, the indeterminate character of liberal freedom, the fact that it has no uh, goal beyond itself, nothing it is in communication with, the indeterminate character of liberal freedom renders it unable to answer the question, what is freedom for? Let me bring these rambling remarks to a close. Viewed from a Tocquevillian perspective, 
the liberal political order that limits governments, separates public and private spheres, recognizes the equal moral and political standing of individuals, establishes authority on secular grounds, and provides for popular participation in its deliberative procedures. All of that has been headed for a crisis insofar as it has always rested on social foundations that abstract liberal principles erode. In the words of one more political theorist, you'll forgive me, Margaret Canavan, modern liberal democratic ideals depend for their plausibility on the collective power generated by national loyalties that are inconsistent with the ideals themselves. That's a summary of the main point I've, I've made and perhaps uh, have made too many times now. In Democracy in America, Tocqueville juxtaposes, interestingly, two discussions of what he calls the public spirit and the idea of rights, as if emphasizing the very duality that we've been considering. This is from uh, volume one, part two, chapter six, on the uh, advantages of democracy. Regarding the first, the first end of this uh, duality, Tocqueville notes the existence of what he calls an instinctive and unreflective patriotism, a love that ties a man's heart to the place where he was born and mingles with a taste for customary habits and collective memories. But there is another, more rational patriotism, less ardent, he says, but more durable, that grows with the exercise of political rights and mingles with one's personal interest. In this more reflective patriotism, a man understands the influence which his country's well-being has on his own. And this leads him to take an interest in his country's well-being, first as something useful to him, but afterwards as something that is his own creation, something that's consistent, you might say, with his own freedom. But... When customs, mores, and old beliefs are shaken or destroyed, Tocqueville says, both kinds of patriotism are lost. And people then see their country only by a weak and doubtful light. It's, it's an interesting image on the one hand, this enlightened perception that perhaps there's a connection between my good and my country's good. But then something happens with the loss of attachments that causes a weakening of this capacity of sight. What he means and what he says is that people then see their country nowhere and they retreat into a narrow and unenlightened egoism. And Tocqueville leaves no doubt that we live, he thinks, in a time of dissolution, of dissolving attachments. Do you not see, he writes, that religions are growing weak and that the conception of the sanctity of rights is vanishing? Notice the religious element. Do you not see that mores are changing and that the moral conception of rights is being obliterated with them? The remedy, though, is not to try and re-inspire that instinctive or disinterested patriotism, which Tocqueville uh, assures us has fled beyond recall, but to get people to see that individual interest is linked to that of their country. Instead of narrow and unenlightened egoism, encourage a broader and enlightened perception of self-interest well understood, as he famously says, 
one that notices the connection between one's individual betterment and the prosperity of the whole country. The only way to revivify a decaying civil spirit is, he says, to interest men in the fate of their country by getting them to participate in its government and exercise their political rights. We have arrived back at my point of departure, and I hope we haven't merely been going in circles. If Tocqueville is correct, that the problem of liberal democracy is fundamentally a problem of the individual soul, then we must, I think, discuss the nature of education in our democracy. And if the health of our national soul is at stake, then we ought to discuss what civic education ought to be. And if only freedom can save us, then I imagine we ought to discuss how to restore education for freedom, also known as liberal education. And luckily, the person I know who has thought the most and the best about liberal democracy, civic education, and liberal education is my friend Joe Neppenberg. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cole, and thank you, Dan, for that. That's uh, wonderful. Um, I'm going to move it over now uh, to a friend, Dr. Joseph Nittenberg, here with a response uh, to that lecture, that presentation, uh, and then we will open it up to Q&A from the audience. Um, and so please, if you have questions, uh, send them in. But with that, Dr. Nittenberg, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm, I have to say I very much appreciated uh Dan's talk. I appreciated it reading it, and I appreciated it uh, even more listening to it. I'm grateful to Ben Gross for his invitation to comment on Dan's most interesting talk. I'm also grateful to the Jack Miller Center and the Alabama Humanities Alliance for their support of this pro program. Dan is a dear old friend, my partner in crime on multiple occasions, and Ben is a dear newer friend. I wish we were all together in person, not on screens, but here we are in our various places. At the end of his talk, Dan encourages me to say a few words about civic education and liberal education. I will, but I've got a bit of throat clearing to undertake before I get there. I'll begin by saying that I agree with Dan's description of our problem, that the unencumbered self of classical liberal theory ex exists in tension with the Republican, that is, small r, self-government. The liberty of the state of nature as articulated by, say, John Locke and his successors, including a couple of other Johns, John Stuart Mill, John Rawls, is supposed to be the foundation of our political liberty. But that political liberty is closer to what uh, the French thinker Benjamin Constant calls the liberty of the ancients, the self-government of citizens who have what it takes, Republican virtue, to cooperate in and sacrifice for the vindication of their freedom. Why and how should the unencumbered self, the language comes from Harvard political theorist Michael Sandel, be encumbered with the responsibilities of citizenship necessary for political liberty? One could state the issue this way. Our theory doesn't adequately inform or serve our practice. That is the practice of self-government that we call upon it to justify and may in fact undermine it. Dan cites a number of contemporary observers who make some version of this argument. I can add a couple of others. The Canadian political thinker George Parkin Grant lived between 1918 and 1988, and the Notre Dame political theorist Patrick Deneen, whose Why Liberalism Failed gained Barack Obama's attention back in 2018, and whose new book, Regime Change, offers a not very appealing and persuasive way out, or not very appealing or persuasive way out. Dan also mentions our dear departed friend, Peter Lawler, who offers in his posthumously published The Constitution in Full, a sophisticated account of what Dan calls the two constitutions. All of this name checking is to say that Dan is not a prophet crying in the wilderness. He is rather pursuing a well-grounded line of analysis that doesn't receive the attention it deserves in contemporary political discourse. We are very happy to engage in rights talk as if almost everything we needed to be free were contained in the articulation and assertion of rights. 
Tocqueville already observed and complained about this in Democracy in America. As I noted at the outset, Dan calls upon me to address how education, civic and liberal, the two aren't the same, can begin to help us think about and address the way our theory of individual liberty endangers our liberty, or you might say our practice of liberty. I'm going to proceed by quoting and commenting on a couple of passages. The first is from a source more or less contemporaneous with Tocqueville's Democracy in America, Abraham Lincoln's Young Men's Lyceum speech on the perpetuation of our political institutions delivered in 1838. In response to what he calls the mobocratic spirit, which follows from an impatience with the forms and formalities connected with the rule of law and a zealous self-righteousness about what's right in our own eyes, Lincoln says this, and here I will uh, quote at length, uh, let every American, let uh, every lover of liberty, every well-wisher to his posterity, swear by the blood of the revolution never to violate in the least particular the laws of the country and never to tolerate their violation by others. As the patriots of 76 did to the support of the Declaration of Independence, so to the support of the Constitution and laws, let every American pledge his life, his property, and his sacred honor. Let every man remember that to violate the law is to trample on the blood of his father and to the tear the character of his own and his children's liberty. Let reverence for the laws be breathed by every American mother to the lisping babe, prattles on her lap. Let it be taught in schools, in seminaries, and in colleges. Let it be written in primers, spelling books, and almanacs. Let it be preached from the pulpit, proclaimed in legislative halls, and enforced in courts of justice. And in short, let it become the political religion of the nation and let the old and the young, the rich and the poor, the grave and the gay of all sexes and tongues and colors and conditions sacrifice unceasingly upon its altars. What the young Lincoln proposes is a very rigorous civic education undertaken not just in schools, but in every possible venue, including every American mother breathing it to her lisping babe. Of course, Lincoln is not just talking about mere history and civics, and not even just about self-interest rightly understood, about which more later. We shouldn't want to trample on the blood of our fathers, the fathers who sacrificed so much for us. Here we can think about what Lincoln in his first inaugural calls the mystic cords of memory, stretching from every patriot grave to every heart and hearthstone. But I have more to quote from this speech. Here's another passage whose tenor and substance is a little bit at odds with the, the, the first passage. He says, I do not mean to say that the scenes of the revolution are now or ever will be entirely forgotten, but that like everything else, they must fade upon the memory of the world and grow more and more dim by the lapse of time. In history, we hope, they will be read of and recounted so long as the Bible shall be read. But even granting that they will, their influence cannot be what it heretofore has been. Even then, they cannot be so universally known nor so vividly felt as they were by the generation just gone to rest. At the close of that struggle, nearly every adult male had been a participator in some of its scenes. The consequence was that those scenes in the form of a husband, father, a son or brother, a living history was to be found in every family a history bearing the indubitable testimonies of its own authenticity in the limbs mangled and the scars of wounds received in the midst of the very scenes related, a history too that could be read and understand, understood alike by all, the wise and the ignorant, the learned and the unlearned. But those histories are gone. They can be read no more. They were a fortress of strength. But what invading foemen could never do, the silent artillery of time has done the leveling of its walls. They are gone. They were a forest of giant oaks, but the all resistless hurricane has swept over them and left only here and there a lonely trunk, despoiled of its verdure, shorn of its foliage, unshading and unshaded to murmur in a few gentle breezes and to combat with its mutilated limbs, a few more ruder storms than to sink be no more. They were the pillars of the Temple of Liberty. And now that they have crumbled away, that temple must fall, unless we, their descendants, supply their places with other pillars 
hewn from the solid quarry of sober reason. Passion has helped us, but can do so no more. It will in future be our enemy. Reason, cold, calculating, unimpassioned reason, must furnish all the materials for our future support and defense. Let those materials be molded into general intelligence, sound morality, and in particular, a reverence for the Constitution and laws. Now, that's a long quote. Uh, uh, I will excuse Lincoln by saying that he was a relatively young man, 29, I believe, when he uh, uh, spoke those very uh, eloquent uh, words. But what he says in the second passage I quoted sounds a lot more like what Dan says Tocqueville calls for. If patriotism is faded and indeed must fade, as those mystic cords of memory stretch ever more thinly, then what we're left with, Lincoln suggests, is reason, you know, self-interest perhaps, uh, rightly understood. But how can the material supplied by reason be molded into general intelligence, sound morality, and a reverence for the Constitution and laws? It doesn't seem to me hard to draw a line between reason and general intelligence. Surely one of the purposes of our entire educational system is to cultivate <clears throat> critical thinking, and to provide the knowledge and skills necessary to be, as is often said, a productive member of society. We might even connect reason uh, to sound morality, though there the line might seem a little less clear. Leaving aside the famous or infamous fact-value distinction, which might seem to relativize morality, are we confident that reason produces only one fundamental moral code? The great uh, 20th century uh, critic and novelist and Christian apologist, C.S. Lewis, makes such an argument. One that has some force, I think, in the abolition of man. While there are surely differences between, say, utilitarianism and the Kantian categorical imperative, there are still, Lewis would argue, family resemblances. They're branches of the same tree. And neither Lincoln nor Lewis has to argue that reason by itself, with nothing added, produces sound morality. Consider this passage from The Abolition of Man. Lewis there says, without the aid of trained emotions, the intellect is powerless against the animal organism. I had sooner play cards against a man who was quite skeptical about ethics, but bred to believe that a gentleman does not cheat, than against an irreproachable moral philosopher who had been brought up among sharpers. Call your attention here to the expressions bred and brought up. Children are bred and brought up long before they enter school. My wife and I homeschooled our kids. She used to tell others who were considering homeschooling their kids that they were in fact already doing so, regardless of their child's age. You start educating your child from the very beginning. Moral education, at the very least, starts long before children board the yellow school bus. I'll say more about this in a moment. The hardest argument seems to me to be to draw the connection between reason and reverence for the Constitution and laws. Consider the most impressive products of reason that most of us encounter, the findings of modern science. Science strives on a certain kind of skepticism, understands itself as progressive. I know that a few years ago, we heard a lot about settled science, but a real science, scientist, not a political scientist, knows that science is always a bare moment from being unsettled. Although he was, of course, unaware of modern empirical science, Aristotle understood very well the difference between an enterprise that depended upon always incomplete and ever being improved reasoning, science, and the rule of law. Laws derive a good bit of their authority, not from their truth, but from their age from the prejudice or comfort derived from a longstanding habit. Back to the chase. Reverence and reason would seem to be antithetical. Knowing the limitations of human reason in most of us, or if you're an adherent of an Abrahamic religion, in all of us, even a philosopher might say that a multitude can't be philosophic. It can't be ruled by reason or rule itself by reason. Most of us accede to the rule of science, to be sure, and make use of the wonderful things it provides without actually understanding the substance of that science. I exclude from this my, my good friend, Ben Gross, who uh, 
was a real scientist long before he was a political scientist. Of course, I have now offered a reason for not relying too much on reason. Reason may not produce the reverence for the Constitution and laws, but it might still approve of that reverence. Now, I'm closing in on 40 years of teaching experience. I know that the youth are, in large measure, given to irreverence, at least by the time they reach me. All too often, they don't know about old things, they don't care about them, or care to learn about them. This may not be true of youth per se, or even of all youth here and now. But it certainly seems to be true of many, if not most, youth in a progressive or dynamic society, as opposed to in a traditional society. Nothing is further from the spirit of most of my students than the traditionalism and filial piety they see in their brief encounter with Confucius in one of my classes. So reverence would seem to be hard to come by here and now. I can't produce it by close readings of the founding documents or platonic dialogues or heaven forbid of constitutional law cases. Here I have to circle back to the family. We are called by God to honor our father and our mother. There's the possibility of a certain reverence there, whether or not the children have heard the scriptural injunction. This could provide a foundation for the reverence that Aristotle thinks is necessary and for which Lincoln calls. <clears throat> Remember all the references to the family in the Young Men's Lyceum speech. What's more, Rousseau, whom I, I'm hesitant to cite in the presence of my good friends and colleagues, both of whom are much better Rousseau scholars than I am. Rousseau reminds us that the family is, in his view, the most natural social union, and that parental love and responsibility serve as the foundation for a kind of natural attachment to a wider social and political order. It's because I'm a spouse and a parent with responsibilities for others that I realize and recognize that I can provide for them better in a stable social and political order. This recognition both grounds and limits my pledge of allegiance to that country, to my country. Because I have these relationships and responsibilities, which for me come first. I'm not the Spartan mother who tells her son to come back home with his shield, with his shield or on it, that is victorious or dead. My self-interest, rightly understood, attaches me to this order. But at the same time, all meaning in my life doesn't come from it. I'm not the denatured, I'm not denatured the way the citizen in Rousseau's social contract is, deriving my dignity solely from my role as an abstractly equal part of the general will. But we all know that the family's in trouble, that there are lots of absent or mostly absent fathers. Parenting is often outsourced to daycares, preschools, schools, after school programs, and nannies, that screens are frequently used to distract and pacify children. And that paradoxically, perhaps, we lived in an age of child-centered parenting. And then there are the declining marriage and fertility rates, which are not just American phenomena, but worldwide. To consider in this connection the picture painted by the famous or infamous 2012 Obama campaign ad, The Life of Julia, which depicts a woman moving from cradle to grave, going through all stages of life, including, so to speak, Planned Parenthood, with the assistance of a beneficent government, but without a man ever being part of her life. Who needs men when you have a beneficent government? That suggests you know, the, the, they thought they could gain some track, traction by depicting uh, not any sort of traditional family. Now, some, including my old friend Patrick Deneen, might be inclined to blame liberalism for this. Indeed, in his second treatise, John Locke reconstructs the family on individualist and contractarian grounds. Grounds that are, as I tell my students, perhaps flexible enough to account for every possible version of the so-called modern family, i.e. for whatever two or more consenting adults want to arrange for themselves, for however long they want it. But I should add, Locke only takes us halfway uh, to where we are, or if that, to where we are today. While voluntary choice is indeed the foundation of Locke's conception of the family, it remains distinguished from other contracts by its procreative character. The consenting adults Locke describes and discusses are parents, not merely partners, 
And the love parents have for their children affects and limits how they conceive their roles. The question Locke would have them ask is not what they want, but what's good or best for the children. We're not yet at Immanuel Kant's arid conception of a contract for the mutual and exclusive use of the genitals, which seems to leave the kids out of it, let alone at a point where exclusivity becomes optional or negotiable. Still, Locke's anthropology has a hard time explaining the role of sacrificial love, which parents should feel for their children and husbands and wives for one another. We get that much more clearly and forcefully from the New Testament, which presents the church as the bride of Christ, and of course, Christ sacrificed all. Let me bring these comments to a close. You might think I've wandered pretty far from consideration of civic education, but I really haven't. If following Lincoln, civic education begins in the home with the family, and if, stu if the students we encounter anywhere along the way are, of course, sons and daughters, then what they bring us limits what we as educators can do with or for them. Let me repeat, if reverence of a sort is necessary, as Lincoln says it is, this is not something we can evoke or conjure up in a classroom. I believe, to be sure, that to be human is to have a capacity for reverence. This may be a controversial statement, but I'm willing to contend that we either revere someone or something else, or we revere ourselves. The current form of the latter is what we call, what some call expressive individualism, and what Rousseau would uh, surely recognize as a form of amor pro. That's not a pro very promising basis for any kind of civic education. But we human beings are capable of learning from our mistakes. If expressive individualism is a mistake, and I uh, think it is, then a certain kind of civic education can give us some signs pointing to a way out. Tocqueville's Democracy in America says, for example, that religion is the first of our political institutions, not because we have or need an established state sponsored church but because it helps us use our liberty well. We can and should teach that part of Tocqueville. Even those who are not themselves religious might come to appreciate the role of religion in self-government. And Tocqueville also spends some time talking about the distinctively democratic family he finds in America. I've gone on too long to say anything about that, but happy to answer any questions if you have them. Or I might just kick them either to uh, Ben or to Dan. But I will say that there's enough in Tocqueville and in writers like him, Orestes Brownson, John Courtney Murray, and Peter Lawler, all come to mind, along with the authors mentioned by Dan, above all Pierre Menon and Roger Cruden, to give us a much richer conception of civic education. It's not just facts, dates, and founding or other important documents. Don't get me wrong, these are important, and we shouldn't ignore them. But a rational love of country has to begin with the experience and understanding of the most human of loves, and those loves are found in the family. Uh, thank you very much, and I uh, encourage you now to ask questions or make comments. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Joe, Dan, that was, that was wonderful. I appreciate it. Um, we have some questions in the Q&A, and I'll uh, get those uh, asked here in a second. But if you have questions, please feel free to send them in now or uh, raise your hand. We can always unmute you. You can ask them yourselves. Um, but one question that we have here is, um, what of the idea that Tocqueville's reflective patriotism could enable not only a linking between personal liberty and national identity, but beyond that to a linking between personal liberty and an international or perhaps global identity? between and among free individuals across national borders. Um, so it appears to be, you know, a question there about this reflective patriotism. Is there a limit at the national border or could that be extended beyond the national border to something that's regional or global? Uh, I think, I think I would say both on my own behalf and, and Tocqueville's that the world is not and cannot be a patrie. That the attachment that's um, at the heart of, or indispensable to this kind of um, even the more 
limited rational patriotism um, by definition attenuates as it extends more more broadly so there is there is a relation of humanity you might say and a way of identifying with the individual anywhere and and everywhere that emphasizes the the idea of of rights but it's it's really difficult to conceive of it as a political re relation michael walzer once said in um an argument with um who who wrote the the martha nisbaum sorry um making the the argument for a uh, kind of stoic citizenship of the of the world idea and walzer's comment was uh where do i send my taxes or how do i pay my taxes to global humanity and uh i think he was he was getting at this idea that if citizenship is going to be meaningful it has to be limited and where Manon comes in i would say is reminding us that in in modern times democracy has only worked really only been possible when it is attached to an existing political form and the political form that we have is the nation and when one looks at efforts which are understandable to to go beyond the limits of the nation and perhaps cultivate a more uh, enlightened i think it's fair to say a more humane new uh association there's no there's no political form that um that can contain the the aspiration and give it actual life and um Manon, who's quite critical of this tendency towards universality says that um what it represents is is a a new religion which he calls the religion of humanity which uh, indeed has is animated by a conception of rights but not really by a credible conception of of citizenship let me piggyback on that and just add a couple of things one a kind of uh Rousseauian wisecrack, where he says the uh, pretended cosmopolitan loves people across the world so as not to not to have to love his neighbor, hmm. uh, and that's uh, harsh. It, it's it's very hard. Hmm. Uh, but the kinds of cosmopolitans uh, Rousseau was uh, observing in the salons were not people who loved their neighbors. They probably thought of a lot of them as uh, and as what uh, another cosmopolitan uh, said: baskets of deplorables. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there's Kant, who, you know, was the great articulator of a, a kind of federal vision of perpetual peace in the in the late uh, 18th century. And even there, uh, Kant says that a world government would be, as he put it, a soulless despotism. That his uh, federation for perpetual peace presupposes the continuing existence of nation states, it looks a whole lot more like NATO than it does like a world government. Uh, now, there are, I, I don't want to deny that there are uh, ways in which we can attempt to, you know, cultivate a, a, a broader scope for our sympathy. And uh, you know, Martha Nussbaum is at least somewhat persuasive on you know broadening our sympathy but uh i think when you ask the hard question of uh, how does that play itself out in any sort of organization uh what kinds of mechanisms for uh, responsibility and accountability are there and uh, what sorts of mechanisms for enforcement are there uh, i think that uh, we're left with something like uh, a nation state uh and uh you know the, the 
materials we have to cultivate citizenship really do begin with uh, the most intimate ones and, and broaden from there. Uh, and they broaden only so far and they're always qualified by those, or one hopes that they're always qualified by those those intimate connections because they're the ones that are most real for us and are in, in many respects most humanizing. Yeah. Ben, could I add a, a couple of things? I, I love the question. I, th I think it's it's terrific and, and it's it's profound and it ought to make us pause and think about uh, about justice and the the scope of of justice but i'm i'm reminded of of two things that i think are are relevant and maybe help illuminate some of the things i was saying too abstractly about the need for attachments joe mentioned uh, the canadian philosopher george parkin grant who um i knew for for a while and um one time I had I invited him to my my college in in Canada to give a talk on uh, his little book, which was on this um, liberal liberal theory. It was called in English Speaking Justice, and um, I had a room there of faculty, students, and a few dignitaries, a couple of politicians, and the chancellor of my university. And I asked Grant, you know, to start off with. So why did you write this book? And of course, I thought, what in your deep reading of Locke and Rousseau and John Rawls and others led you to, to do this? And he just pointed across the table to the chancellor, who was uh, Alex Colville, famous Canadian painter. And he said, that man there. And, and he just stopped. And everybody in the room was... <laughs> Did you know what what does this mean? And and uh, I said, what do you mean? And his answer was, life is lived by loyalties. Life is lived by loyalties. This was my friend. He seriously asked me to do something. I undertook this project. Um. A different, a different example that I, I witnessed uh, recently from a Netflix documentary, I think it was Netflix, uh, on the making of that famous uh, fundraising song, We Are the World. You all know ab about it. Uh, Lionel Richie was at the heart of it. Lionel Richie and Michael Jackson wrote the song together. And, you know, it has all of these uh, great uh, humanitarian themes. Well, the um, the story that's so interesting is how they got and they hired uh, Quincy Jones to to produce the thing. How they got all of these ego maniacal rock stars who are all over the world and all over the country doing their own thing to come together in Los Angeles to record this song and not have anybody know about it because once the media got wind of it, there would be hordes of fans disrupting it. So the, the whole point of it is this great humanitarian cause that they're all contributing to. But the whole uh, narrative was about how the rock stars got to be there. And it turned out it was one friend or personal acquaintance uh, going to another, telling them this is something that you have to do. And by the way, most of them didn't even know what they were going to be doing. They just knew that somebody wanted them to show up in this place, and it was going to be after a big award show. None of them knew what the heck they were going to be doing, but they came. And uh, my favorite part of it was when one of the people who had been invited understood that she was only asked to be there because Quincy Jones uh, or Lionel Richie thought she could get Prince, who they didn't have lined up. And she was offended by that, um, but then seemed to get over it. So, so here's, the, again, this great humanitarian cause. But although they heard a brief speech about the, the need for the, for the effort, it was all personal 
connections, personal attachments, personal loyalties that actually made the thing happen. And I thought that was remarkable. Go watch that documentary. It's, it's, it's great. No, absolutely. And I think this also reminds me, uh, perhaps for some of my students, um, you know, the idea of, of that relationships matter in a lot of the shows they watch, a lot of the meat, right? It's, at the end of the day, uh, even as something as uh, twisted and dark, perhaps as an animated series like Rick and Morty, uh, in that show, it's about the relationships those people have that that brings things together. Um, and I think this brings up the point that you brought up, Joe, in the sense of who do we have relations with? Uh, do we have relations with our neighbors, uh, with our colleagues, um, or do we have relations more with uh, things we see on the screen? Um, that perhaps our ideas that we are committed to, um, but are far away from us and not tangible in that sense of our, our sit fellow citizens or our fellow neighbors. Um, and that disconnect potentially between the idea uh, and the actual presence um, seems to be something that um, I see, you know, not only in my own, but in our students' lives a lot more today uh, than what we had to, you know, engage with even just a few decades ago. Well, there's um, a lot of literature. Let me just. Add, yeah. There's a lot of literature on uh, loneliness now, uh, mm -hmm. and you know we're all uh, we come from. We, we uh, come from and make smaller families, and uh, that may not seem like a, a big deal now when we're younger and are out in the world. But what happens is you age, and you know you you age alone. And uh, there's no one to take care of you, no one to look after you, no one to remember you. And uh, you know, I think I think you know the family crisis is one that uh, is not just a, a a crisis for personal happiness, but also for you know our capacity to uh, be responsible members of communities other than our families. Uh, we have another question here. Um, Kevin asks, uh, what would Tocqueville say about Alexei Navalny? He would certainly, he would certainly ad admire him. He would, um, he would condemn the despotic rule that Naval Navalny lived under. Um, Russia is not a democracy, um, not going to be a democracy in, in any likely future. But I think Tocqueville would have seen in, in Navalny someone who, like Tocqueville himself, had this irrepressible uh, taste as as Tocqueville puts it for freedom for liberty um, I, I think the uh, passage you quoted from the Ancien regime is is uh, very appropriate there where he, uh, Tocqueville talks about how despotism let's see if I can find it uh, rather than struggling against this uh, this this tendency to withdraw uh, Makes it irresistible because it takes away from citizens all common feeling, all, all common needs, all need for communication, all occasion for common action. Uh, in some ways, you might say, Putin would have rather Navalny had not come back to to Russia. But uh, and he wants all the you know the, the the dissidents to be isolated, and that's certainly been the pattern not just in Putin's Russia, but in the Soviet Union. Mm. And so you know, what Tocqueville says of despotism is you know, very evident in this particular case. Absolutely. Uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to write them in the Q&A and send them or raise your hand, I can unmute you. Um, you know, Dan, one question that comes to me, uh, you brought up justice earlier. Um, I wonder about uh, the good, in a sense, um, is one of the problems that perhaps we're seeing in this tension, um, a confusion or a loss of understanding um, or a loss of trust in either the civic 
life as the good life or the you know life of reason as the good life that neither of these seem to be pointing us to an idea or a concept of what's good for us when i was when i was thinking about this talk and and reading um reading some new things but i mean this is an issue i've been carrying around um with me like an overstuffed uh, bag for for years and trying to explore it from one angle or or another i kept coming back to mill and um i think uh, joe has actually persuaded me of this that there's there's more to to mill than um i tend to to think uh, especially looking at on liberty alone but i was reminded of that uh, really interesting passage i quoted from manant where he said that you know uh, liberalism uh, emancipated or this this notion of of individual freedom as a progressive emancipation um, if one looks to the end of, of of the trajectory and sees its final victory, um, you're left with this question: Well, what now? Um, why should I do this? Why should I do that? And and Menon's suggestion is, as as you heard, that um, for liberalism to itself to be vital, for this understanding of freedom to be to be vital. It has to be in some kind of dialogue, is his term, with something beyond itself. And Menant thinks Christianity is, is the most likely candidate. But there's one uh, particular passage in On Liberty from uh, chapter three called On Individuality, right? Where Mill said, you know, he's, he's made this argument that... Um, we have we're, we're going to have experiments in living and in the same way that we might have the clash of ideas and some sort of uh marketplace but he doesn't use that that term uh we'll do the same thing with experiments and living but it's just as the clash of ideas is defensible because it's going to help us achieve truth as the result we'll find out what the best way to live is by these allowing all of these experiments in living a utilitarian defense of of freedom you could say only now in a more a moral context but he he i think lets this um lets that facade drop at one point where he says that mode of life is best not because it is best in itself but because it is one's own mode. And this is after he's he's said that, you know, sure, a person who lives his life or her life on the straight and narrow, uh, never really challenges authority and, and so on, just does what's expected, follows the norms, can, can turn out okay, uh, be a decent person, and then he has this really acid um, conclusion to that, where he says, but what will be that person's worth as a human being, right? And that's where he refers to the the, uh, the mere ape-like quality of, of uh, imitation, if you just follow customary norms. But I think that statement, that proposition one's mode of life is best not because it is best in itself but because it is one's own mode is precisely about replacing the idea of a good or the good with choice it's choice that confers the uh the value uh and 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 thus the the goodness and that's a very consequential thing if if we think about just what it would mean at the experiential level it it seems to me um let me uh embellish all that. of this was to provoke joe and i yes. and, yeah. <laughs> okay right. well uh i was thinking 
as as Dan was talking about, uh, you know, Marx's description of the end of history, where you're going to be a, a hunter in the morning, a fisherman in the afternoon, herd cattle at some point, and then be a critical critic after dinner. And I also remember what someone told me that uh, the great Harvard political theorist, uh, Judith Sklar, said about that, which is at the end of history, we have hobbies. Uh, sort of meaningless pastimes hmm. that we're free from all necessity and there's no trajectory of our lives. We just do whatever we feel like doing, which sounds wonderful until you don't, uh, until you get sick of yourself. <laughs> you get bored. And, you know, the same sort of bleak picture of the end of history that uh, was popularized in, in, in some ways by uh, Francis Fukuyama in, in the book that uh, initially made his reputation. He's had many more to embellish his reputation since then. But the end of history in The Last Man. And uh, you know, the, the Last Man is a reference to... Uh, the prologue to uh, Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra, where uh, there's also a very bleak picture of a kind of uh, egalitarian satisfaction, let's call it that. And I uh, have come to think of that as just a kind of uh, very exaggerated version and of uh, what Tocqueville says about the the despotism democracies have to fear at the end of uh, democracy in America, which again we are most govern governable when we are uh, purposeless, when we don't have aims, uh, when you know, in in sort of classic philosophic terms borrowed from uh, Plato, when we we don't have arrows, and uh, that. You know, the uh, Eros makes us both danger dangerous and interesting. And uh, it makes us not good subjects. It makes us capable. It makes us want to be free in, in, in that sense. And um, I'm thinking here also of uh, C.S. Lewis's, uh, the third book in, in Lewis's space trilogy, That Hideous Strength, where... Uh, you know, there's an attempt to uh, make reason triumph at, at, at the expense of all organic life. You know, organic life makes us interesting. It makes us relational. It makes us want things. It makes us desire other people. And uh, you know, the, the kind of love that uh, Christians would uh, offer also points us in, in uh, toward a, a kind of fulfillment that uh, you know gives our lives and our freedom a kind of meaning. Uh, so uh, it's hard to talk about freedom by itself, but always in a kind of context. You have to want to be free for the sake of something, and uh, freedom by itself seems to devolve into a kind of nihilism. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. Joe brought up the importance of religion uh, several times and and that's something Tocqueville emphasizes and and something that I slighted in my own remarks it's it's noteworthy I think that we use the term uh, religiously as um, a, a synonym for seriously you know I I used to be religious about playing squash three times a week because I'd, I'd be in a bad mental frame of mind if I, if I, if I didn't, that, that notion of taking something seriously. And I was, I was thinking when Joe uh, talked about reverence, uh, he said something, many things interesting, but this really leapt out at me. Um, he said, I've, I've now offered a reason for not relying too much on reason. Reason may not produce the reverence for the constitution and laws, but it might still approve of that reverence. That's that's a really profound point, I think. One of the one of the great insights of Roger Scruton, I think, in into the contemporary world is 
his reflection on why the attitude of, of reverence is so difficult to, um, to find or to maintain. And I think Joe's right that among our, our students, reverence is, is um, not something one, one hears much. Why? Because it, it seems to be so unsophisticated and, and we're all concerned with, with being, with being that. And we might also think that reverence for things could be contaminated by some injustice and in, involved in those, in those things, especially if it's uh, traditional social norms and, and there's truth to that. But what Scruton uh, drew attention to as a really corrosive influence in contemporary society is what he called a culture of repudiation, a kind of deliberate iconoclasm that would, um, you know, ex expose all uh, commitments or or um, all agreements or even all loves as as somehow fraudulent or deceived or again uh, infected with injustice and in the um, you know in the sophisticated intellectual class on what used to be Twitter um, you you find that culture and perhaps only that that culture driving things. Um, now that it's called X, I'm, I'm not sure what what the equivalent of a of a tweet is, but there's something about communicating by by tweets, um, one liners, uh, put downs, etc. That that really is corrosive, not just of of you know customary or traditional morality, but but I'd say just serious thinking, serious discussion and and argument. And back to the theme of education, uh, lastly, I think that's part of that's part of what I see anyway in the um, the difficulty of of having serious discussion. I think students want it, uh, need it, and and are sensible of it. But there there is this sort of veneer of, of um, I'll, I'll call it sophistication for lack of a, of a better word, that I think interferes with it. Uh, we have a question here um, that's uh, touching on the recent politics in the, of our state. Um, how do the principles of reason and reverence influence decisions regarding the legality and regulation of IVF? Joe's the political scientist here, so I'm gonna. That's right. You can duck behind your your philosophy title. Pass uh, that one to him. I, I, I mean, I think it's a very obviously a very difficult issue, and uh, it's 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 one of the uh, great conundrums that uh, our continuing technological progress uh, uh, makes available, uh, and it's it's. You know, the, the question is really one of, uh, you know, the, the nature and uh, the nature of the human person. And uh, I think the, you know, it's rightly a question uh, that communities have to answer for themselves. And the, the right place to address that question uh for Alabama is in the is in the Alabama legislature, and I gather that they have uh, tried to uh, walk a very fine line, uh, because uh, you know one very easy answer is to say that the fertilized embryo is just property, but then uh, something a being which, if implanted, would be, become a human being is at some point property, and uh, I'll only say this, the, you know, the state of Alabama and my home state of Georgia uh, have, how should I say, a very unfortunate history of regarding uh, human beings as property. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, we, I don't want to go down that path. I'm, I, when I, I talked with uh, about this case with my students, I said, I, you know, I predicted that 
there would be an answer, uh, a legislative answer very soon. Uh, and while judges should rightly not introduce their own religious views into their uh, interpretations of law and the Constitution, uh, I don't think there's any way, uh, and, and I don't think we should discourage uh, legislators from consulting their consciences before they vote, and those consciences may be religiously informed or, or, or formed. Uh, and, you know, I do think that helping people become parents, if parenthood and family formation is extremely important, uh, is something we ought to applaud in some way. Uh, and certainly support. Uh, but uh, no, I, so I, I do think there were some difficulties there and some, and I, I haven't paid close enough attention to the legislative solution to know uh, whether, uh, you know, on reflection, they, they got it right from my point of view. But uh, I do recognize the, the difficulty here and, uh, yeah, I, I don't think there are any easy answers because, you know, the the one easy answer that would have essentially made this all go away would have been uh, a kind of dehumanizing answer. Yeah, I just add to that. I mean, I I've I've thought about this like we we all have um, recently and um, not not for the first time. And. I think there 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 is a a genuine dilemma here or an interesting duality to use that term again because on on the one hand it's incontrovertible that people who pursue IVF desperately want a family um it's the whole process is driven by by love and and by a deep human need and it has a sacrificial dimension that goes along with parenthood as we as we all know it's uh it's all sacrifice if there wasn't such a great happiness uh toward it it um it'd be a crazy crazy deal on the other hand there's this um very fitting sense and and even um horror of of the idea of using an embryo uh, just as as joe says as as property or as matter for research or for um allowing embryos to be to be sold for for such purposes and um i i think this this is one of those questions that needs a legislative resolution rather than a judicial one although in our system, it's uh, it's increasingly hard to expect expect that. Um, but in the best case scenario, a, a legislative solution would involve reference to a community's norms, its moral understanding, its its past, um, its commitments. And those might not be shared in in another part of the of the country. Uh, this is one of the things that does make our politics free and and keep it free. Although there is also a, a legitimate argument that there are some questions that need not a patchwork um, compromise, but a clear and and general and and national solution. But I uh, I don't have a I don't have a position quote unquote to pronounce on on this one yet. And I think this is one where um, reason and reverence can, at some ways, point similarly, but also point against in the different directions, which makes it again uh, such a difficult topic uh, to provide you know a clear answer to. Um, because of course there's a reverence there for life, even within the reason, um, that's the foundation of liberalism. Um, but that reason also therefore opens up new doors. And so I think of like Cass and Wilson's, a uh, discussion of cloning and even of IVF within that in the nineties. Um, and that might be an instructive place to start for those interested. So right. 
One last question from a student, if you're willing to do a little bit of overtime. Um, I know we've hit our, our mark, but if you're willing to take one last question, um, is that okay, uh, Dan and Joe? Depends on the question. <laughs> this this one, I think, brings it home a bit. Uh, Tyler asks, um, how could Tocqueville's reflective patriotism affect the liberties of people in the United States? Um, so how could reflective patriotism affect our liberties uh, within the uh, United States? I think, it, well, I'm, I'm not quite sure what Tyler means by effect. Does, it, does he have something in in mind? I'm, I'm imagining if, if Tyler was um, libertarian, let's say, he might have a worry that any encouragement of, of patriotism, which is a love and therefore an emotion, even if it's an enlightened one, might somehow um you know unjustifiably or illegitimately uh, intrude on one's one's right to self-direction self-ownership and and so on um so i'm 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 not sure if that's in the in the background i i think that tocqueville's answer is that this is how in a free society which indeed recognizes that individuals are going to be motivated primarily by self-interest and yet their their own uh, dogged pursuit of self-interest could lead them to uh, live in ways that would not be conducive to their flourishing as as human beings the the thing about uh, patriotic attachment is that it causes you to exercise your political rights, to express your freedom politically, doing things in, in common with, with other people, uh, bringing you out of that narrow enclosure of yourself, that all of that, all of that is, is good and, and healthy uh, and fends off that a problem of of corruption of soul that Tocqueville writes of so 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 powerfully. Um, I'm I'm wondering if if Tyler wants to uh, elaborate whether he thinks there's there's a a downside there that we're not we're not accounting for. But Joe might have a thought about this. As... I have a couple of thoughts. One is first, I'd want to uh, insist upon a distinction between. Tocqueville's reflective patriotism and uh, things we might call nationalism or xenophobia. Mm. Uh, that, you know, loving my country reflectively is not the same thing as thinking that my country deserves to rule all others, that my country is uh, somehow superior and more worthy than, than others. Uh, uh, it is, you know, my country and I love it because it's mine and it's, uh, the reflective patriotism is not uh, necessarily, uh, you know, aggressive. I guess I would put it that way. Uh, so I'd, 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 I'd want to be careful to make that distinction. And then uh, I do think uh, the the other thing I would say about reflective patriotism is that uh, I, you know I, I recall. Uh, it was a very small trial, but uh, the, the famous line from John F. Kennedy's speech, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And uh, that is, I think, a, a, an expression of reflective patriotism. Uh, and uh, if we don't have people who are willing on reflection uh, to do things for their country, then we don't have a country. Uh, and, you know, again, the, the, the kind of sober basis of sacrifice is uh, if I can't take responsibility for my family, and I don't mean, you know, in a kind of uh, prepper way, if I can't take responsibility for my family, uh, 
and uh, make the sacrifices necessary for that. Uh, and I expect anyone else to do it. And I, if we, we uh, Dan mentioned one thing on Netflix. Uh, now I'm going to blank on the title, uh, but it was a, a a movie produced by the Obamas uh, that featured a kind of uh, some some kind of apocalypse where uh, you know, some families were very much left to their own devices and and, and reacted differently. Uh, but I I do think that in in some cases, the, the there was little concern, except for one's immediate family, and not much generosity. Uh, and we certainly hope that uh, reflective patriotism would produce uh, people who are willing uh, to make sacrifices, not only for their nearest and dearest, but also for their neighbors and their uh, fellow citizens. And uh, let me let me mention if there's if there's time, just one thing. Joe's reference to Kennedy's famous line uh, triggered something in me. If, if you go to Logan Airport Terminal E, I think uh, playing in a continuous loop are speeches of of Kennedy, and and one memorable passage is um, we we decide to go to the moon not because it's easy, but because it's difficult or because it's hard. And that idea of of challenge and doing something great, I think, is also of of importance to Tocqueville. There's a kind of energy, productive energy, that can be released by um, that combination of self interest, um, well understood, or or the ingredient of it that includes doing something to make your your country greater and not just your yourself that that's a a win-win and i think it's it's also connected to tocqueville's understanding of of what a what a respectable um dignified human liberty would would involve which is never never going to uh, be reducible to having a lot of of choices that one can sort of aimlessly select or, or not select. Absolutely. Uh, well, Dan, Joe, I, I really appreciate this conversation tonight. I can tell you from the questions we've got and from the comments to me, I think uh, people are reflecting and thinking and uh, have really enjoyed our conversation and your lectures and your responses. Um, I think the only thing we're missing is, is fully that community and hopefully uh, we'll have an opportunity to get everyone together at some point here um, as that's something that we love to do here at Jacksonville State University is really get people together, embrace that Tocquevillian spirit uh, of bringing people together in community. Um, but I want to thank you both tonight uh, for this lecture and for this response and for this Q&A because it has been excellent. And so thank you so much. Thank you for uh, doing it. I'm, it's great fun. Okay. And we want to thank the Jack Miller Center and Alabama Humanities Alliance again uh, for allowing us to do this. Uh, we hope you join us uh, in March for our last lecture of the series. Uh, we'll continue the roads to Jacksonville uh, connection there. Uh, where we'll be looking at uh, uh, voting in America, uh, especially the fight for women to vote. Uh, so thank you all for joining us tonight. Have a wonderful night, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.